Okay, well, thank you, people on Zoom, uh, for joining us, and thank you, Miriam, in the room for coming along. Um, so this is our final uh, talk before Easter, uh, and we are uh, really glad to be joined today by Shay Baston. So uh, Shay's come down, come up from uh, Surrey, where he uh, is sort of a full-time. Uh, full-time in person working in industry working on uh it, well i've already uh, image something to do with um, images and tv yeah, <laughs> and, um, and ai and machine learning right yeah that's, okay. that's, that's right that's more <laughs> or less right yeah <laughs> and before that he was a he was a phd student in, in edinburgh and then a postdoc in in seattle went over to industry in about 2019 but has still been working on research in his own time and he's been collaborating with a few groups here in manchester uh, and so that's the work he's going to talk about today so this is uh this is what he's here to visit us for today and he's going to spend to see a few groups and he's going to be talking about uh, network models of carcinogenesis in colorectal adenocarcinoma and vestibular schwannoma <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. So over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, I think you've, you've, you've stolen the introduction I was going to give on my first slide. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, no, that's, that, that's everything. That's, that's, um, uh, that's where I'm from. Um, this is the first talk that I've given, I think since 2019. Um, I gave a talk at a conference in Seattle. Um, it's also sort of my first day in Manchester, which is my primary affiliation, it has been for a couple of months, but as Carl mentioned, I don't technically work here. Um, and yeah, um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've taken a slight risk with this talk in that I've, I'm going to try and give a talk about mathematical models, um, having removed all the equations and replacing them with large diagrams like this one on the left. Um, my hope, uh, my hope is that the mathematicians in the audience can enjoy trying to mentally translate this back into a linear system with just some large matrix um, and you know try and sketch what the solution should look like. Um, and the experimentalists in the audience can um, uh, I'll just return that label thing. Yeah. I thought it was just on the screen. Okay, right. And the experimentalist can just look at the diagrams and go, yeah, that looks like a reasonable model. Um, it's, uh, it's not really a gimmick because most of the models that I'm going to talk about from my postdoc uh, in Seattle on colorectal cancer um, and from my ongoing collaboration here at Manchester are these fairly large linear systems but they're sparse linear systems writing everything out like it was a big matrix here like this would just give you something that's essentially full of zeros um, so this graphical representation is actually a very efficient uh, a very efficient uh, uh, alternative um, and it uniquely specifies the model we're, we're, we're looking at uh, mainly um, i'm going to be looking at an approximate representation which is literally just a linear uh, differential equation. Okay, what am I interested in modeling? Um, I have broad interests. I'm interested in, don't want to say all, but most cancers, cancer in general. Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, well, there are these various risk factors um, as age, you know, uh, different cancers will have these different sets of risk factors. You know, you have uh, smoking and various types of lung cancer, alcohol and breast cancer, various correlations between diet and colorectal with various effect sizes. Um, the only really universal risk factors um, are age and to some extent genetics. Um, how does this happen? Well, we have some set of mutations, some set of somatic mutations in the cell line in the body. Uh, these accumulate and over time, they result in a loss of control of cell growth and death. So we get some uncontrolled growth of cells, an uncontrolled growing lesion. Something happens to this uncontrolled growth, and this results in a loss of control of cell type. Uh, cells become less sticky. They resemble the tissue they originated from less and less, progressively less. And this results in diffusion 
um, metastasis and migration, um, invasiveness, general invasiveness, and immune evasion, and this, this spreads around the body. Um, I was going to ask people for a show of hands at this point. I'm not sure there are enough hands for this to be worth it, but um, uh, why do we believe this second point about mutations accumulating? Why, what is the line of evidence that gave rise to, to, to this idea? The oldest line of evidence that gave rise to this idea. It's not something, I don't think anything on this slide should surprise anyone. To a large extent, this is like common knowledge to, to some degree, but why do we believe that it arises from some accumulation of somatic mutations in some cell line in the body? The oldest line of evidence ultimately comes down to mathematical models. Um, so from the 1950s, we have this model which treats um, incidents of various cancers, noting that various cancers can be modeled very well with a type of power law. Um, uh, this, uh, um, and this can be explained with some accumulation of mutations in some cell line, right? So we have a set of, uh, 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 we have some chain, some possible chain of events. Um, we have one alteration, two alterations, possibly six or seven alterations. And we find that if we can gather each of these just in some compound Poisson process, um, we end up on the uh, black square here, um, which represents an initiated cancer and uh, of some type on the right. And we have some very nice straight line on a log log plot. We have a nice power ball. This goes back to 1954. Um, there are a few problems with this immediate first, first, uh, uh, first attempt at a model, which is that the mutation rates are pretty high. There's, it's not obvious how to disentangle the number of cells in the, in the relevant tissue from this. Um, and immediately we move on to some improved models. Um, you can see if we look at these graphs on the right, um, it's not difficult to pick out some systematic residuals. We can find some patterns in the model errors, which suggests that there's something important missing. Um, uh, the important thing that was missing is uh, selection. So these little self loops on this diagram here represent there's some exponential growth occurring in each of these nodes. And we find that um, the majority of uh, these cancers can be modeled as having three rate limiting steps, um, followed by some number of steps after some initial three, but these additional steps aren't rate limiting. We have these three additional rate limiting steps, um, and the last couple of stages have some uh, very, very slight, um, have some slight fitness advantage, some selective advantage over the surrounding tissue cells. Um, and this gets us more plausible mutation rates, um, still debatable as to how accurate these are, how well these reflect the actual underlying biology. Um, um, but we get a much, much better fit to the available data. We get an even better fit if we look at uh, cohort specific uh, incidents. Um, and I want to improve on these because these don't, these models, they're more accurate, but they don't. Uh, pick out specific mechanisms, right? We get some coarse grain mutation rate, which doesn't directly correspond uh, to, an, uh, to an underlying molecular mechanism. We know that there are various different ways that you can uh, damage and change what goes on in, in the genome. We don't distinguish between, or this set of models can't distinguish between say, um, a substitution, just changing a base pair, can't distinguish between small deletions, large deletions, you know, gross chromosomal aberrations like changes in copy number, um, uh, you know, copy number loss, uh, mitotic recombination. There are various mechanisms, and this approach of simply having, you know, one set of three mutations um, uh, with uh, uh, and doesn't distinguish between different types. It can't distinguish between these, these different mutational mechanisms. Um, so what we're trying to improve on with these uh, network models is we want to look at specific genes, we want to look at specific mechanisms, right? We want to be able to fix the parameters for these mechanisms, specific mechanisms, 
uh, from available sequences from available experimental data. Um, this is all epidemiological so far. What we have been trying to predict uh, with these models, um, with these multi-stage models, is incidence in some population, or cumulative incidence, or cohort-specific incidence. Um, of what we want to add to this, um, because we can add it now uh, with modern methods, is we want to add uh, specific uh, mutational mechanisms, um, genomic data as well. So we have access to this as well as the epidemiological data that we had before. Um, and the idea, the idea is that we can predict these copy number alterations and uh, genome specific incidents. We can combine incidents and genomic data. Um, and this gets us the incidence of uh, specific carrier types, so specific uh, patterns of copy number alterations, um, uh, which, which are possibly different. So on the left here, going down to the uh, pink end node here, we have uh, an inactivation of a tumor suppressor by two point mutations, like two like small deletions, indels, or um, uh, uh, substitutions. Um, and this other node here with these two paths leading down to it is an inactivation by a different mechanism, which we have one point mutation and one loss, a loss of the other copy on the other chromosome. So we can take into account these two different distinct mechanisms, small mutations and large gross deletions, copy number alterations. Um, so how do we define um, one of these? How do we define a network model in terms of these uh, linear multi-stage models, we can say, well, we have two events of interest. We can write down all the possible orders. You know, we have one possible order here, point mutation followed by point mutation. We can have a point mutation followed by loss of heterozygosity. We could lose the other copy. And there are two possible orders we can do this. We could lose one copy and then we could have some point mutation as well. After we've written down all these possible orders, we can fold these into a graph like this on, on the right. So each one of these paths on the left has a corresponding path in this graph on the right. So leftmost path, point mutation, point mutation, um, rightmost path, you know, copy number alteration, followed by point mutation. And there are as many paths through this network on the right as there are paths that we've drawn out, just enumerated in four on the left here. Um, for, uh, for biological reasons, uh, not all of these orders are, are possible. Some orders are impossible. We can't lose two copies of the same chromosome because this is essentially always, always lethal to the cell line. It will result in a cell that just won't function. Um, once we've drawn this graph, so this is all quite abstract. We're just listing different possible orders of events. Um, once we've drawn this graph, we can go and assign rates to these events, rates with which these happen over time. Um, so we, to get some rate of small mutations, um, we simply take uh, a base mutation rate, like we assume the Duke's Cantor model in uh, both of the papers that I'm going to talk about. So we assume there's one uh, point mutation rate that encapsulates um, substitutions and indels. Um, there's some cell division frequency B, and there's a coefficient NG, which essentially represents uh, the number of possible sites where we could make a change, and this will result in a nonsense mutation. And this is weighted by the probability that this is a substitution versus uh, an indel. Um, and to get the rate of loss of heterozygosity, so the rate over time, that uh, we will see changes and losses of copy number on the relevant chromosome. Um, this is something that we'll need to fix in terms of this base mutation rate by looking at the experimental relative frequencies of um, inactivation by one mechanism and inactivation by, um, by loss of heterozygosity. So we can see, we can measure in principle by looking at carrier types of different uh, cancer cells, which of these mechanisms has occurred, and the relative frequency, we can then work backwards um, and fit and estimate what RLOH should be. Um, so the first model of this type um, that I studied 
was looking at a specific subtype of colorectal cancer, colorectal adenocarcinoma, um, involving three known genes which have been known to have, which have been observed to have uh, uh, some relevance in some number of cases, APC, P53, and KRAS. Individually, uh, these are all very, very common alterations. Um, altogether, they're somewhat less common. They catch about 15% of, of incidence. Um, and the idea is that we will take, um, we will take each of these graphs, we'll form the chromatic product to get the overall network. Um, that will give us, uh, from some starting point, um, the incidence of different specific subtypes um, in um, different specific subtypes with different patterns of topical alterations. Um, so P53, this is very, very common alteration across many, many different types of malignancy. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that although this is a very, very common type of alteration, uh, nobody to my knowledge, at least not in 2020 when we did this, uh, had measured some fitness advantage, some regular fitness advantage to loss of P53, but it's not in colorectal cancer. Um, so it is generally believed to be a driver that the effects are very, very complex. It doesn't fit into this classical picture of we have some, uh, you know, Darwinian selection for E53 loss, I can say, say PCC now. It doesn't quite fit into this, this gradual evolutionary picture, um, but it's, it's still very, very common. Um, so when we take these graphs and we multiply them together, we get some very complex graph that I'll show quickly. Um, this is the version that we actually gave in the figures um, of our PMS paper in 2020. So we start down here at the bottom left. This is where all the colorectal stem cells start in these crypts. And we can mutate at different rates. We'll gradually move up through, through the graph towards uh, some end node up here. The rate at which cells arrive at this end node up here gives us the incidence of colorectal cancer. So, um, the different colors represent different fitness advantages. So uh, gain, gain of KRAS is a different, different fitness advantage to um, loss of function on APC. And together, you know, they have some other fitness advantage, these green cells here, uh, which may, may not simply be the sum of the fitness advantages of, of KRAS and APC. We can constrain what exactly this adds up to what this is just by comparing the predicted incidence to the observed incidence. We can say, okay, epistatic interactions cannot be stronger than this, or they cannot be weaker than this without you know, causing really, really bad disagreement. Um, the full complicated model really, you know, I've, we simplify each of these kind of, each of these lines here shouldn't really be a line. Each of these one lines going up the side should be some complicated, you know, tumor suppressor diagram like this with you know, five different nodes. So we usually have five nodes going up here, five nodes coming along here, we multiply this all by two. And we get some diagram that should have 50 different nodes and four different, you know, subtypes, each of which corresponds to a different pattern of copy number alterations. So over here, we would have uh, loss on 70P, where P53 is located, loss on 5Q, where APC is located. Um, on the others, we would have, say, uh, normal status on chromosome 70, loss of 5Q, a lot around normal carrier type, but they've both been inactivated by point mutations. And uh, yeah, this is, this is significantly more complicated. It's like some 50 dimensional. This is why I, I prefer to lean on the diagrams rather than write out, you know, write out in full. We're writing out this matrix, these terms, you know, it's most people the zeros, you know, it would be some 50 dimensional, you know, you know, it's, it would be a waste of time. So, um, however, although it looks very complicated, um, even though this looks very complicated, there are four parts which are more common than most of the others put together. Um, so about 50% of the predicted uh, incidence or the predicted risk can be attributed to these four different paths, which are each of them equally likely to each other, and collectively they're more likely than all the other 50 possible paths to find. 
no, not 50 possible paths, there are 50 nodes and 120 at 60, at 60, at the 270 possible paths. So, so out of 270, 270 possible paths, these four account for about half of the, the total probability. Um, we have this, this common pattern, they all have the same order of events where APC is inactivated, then KRAS is again a function, and then finally P53 is inactivated, which I found very interesting. Um, and this, this is consistent, consistent with some findings um, by uh, Aaron, um and others, uh, and Kinsler and Vogelstein. Um, they, they, they find, find the same pattern on the APC, then KRAS, then P53. I found it very interesting. Um, I found it very interesting in the overall form. Um, when we solve and we find out how likely they are to visit this, this end node, we find that the actual form of this curve is, is essentially, essentially identical to a three step model. Uh, because when we look at it, we have essentially three rate limiting events, right? First of this rate limiting event is you know, loss of APC, which is two, two steps because it's a tumor suppressor. Then we have gain of and KS, and these, and these are the main, uh, these are the main uh, rate limiting events. Right? The further complex stuff happening with P53 is not rate limiting, it doesn't contribute to the fine line of building very much. Um, contributes a constant factor to it, but you know, it, it doesn't change the form of the curve. So it suggests that um, even though these, uh, let's go back, even though these uh, three, three rate limiting step models have this very good fit, there may be more hits involved. We know experimentally that there may be more hits involved, but only the first three of these are rate limiting. So it's, it's, it's consistent, you know, it's, it's a theory, it's consistent with, um, uh, uh, with this picture. Um, we get the proportion of incidents right, and um, this, what I really, what really captured my imagination about this was we get the proportion of incidents right, we get the, the order, order of magnitude, magnitude of incidents right, um, and this is with no statistical fit. So, so essentially all of these parameters, all of these parameters that go into this model, um, the mutation rates, um, the rate of loss of heterozygosity, with some approximations, all of the mutation rates, most of the fitnesses, these were for the most part um, like direct, direct measurements, measurements uh, and in uh, different, different experiments. experiments. It was a set of experiments in organoids. Um, and we can set these microscopic parameters. Um, thanks, Carl. It's okay. We can set these microscopic parameters um, just experimentally. And there's essentially no actual fitting procedure to experimental instance data. So we can draw some inferences about um, epidemiological properties just by looking at um, uh, just by looking at these from this microscopic level of detail. Just this microscopic level of detail really captured my imagination. Um, we can go a bit further. We can constrain um, epistatic interactions between APC and KRAS. We can say that while the, the overall fitness, this fitness S2 for these uh, green nodes on the right. Um, this can't be any higher than about 0.31 per year. So, so we can provide an upper bound on how strongly APC and KRAS must interact. Um, and uh, the timing of P53 and activation as well, it must be late relative to the other alterations, not late. There's, the, 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 there's a lot of interest in the timing of driver mutations in the cancer relation. Um, I should qualify what I mean by late um, because it can mean different things depending on your point of reference. What I mean is that it's late relative to these other drivers appearing. It's not late, late relative, relative to, to, say, malignancy or detection. We don't really know when these happen in this model. Um, it's compatible with these three hit models. We get the same functional form as we do for other three hit models. Um, and we can also draw some inferences about um, fitness landscapes by looking at the predicted the different probabilities between different parts, how these, how these uh, behave over time. Um, there are some shortcomings. Um, there are some shortcomings. It, it's a big advance in terms of, I think, especially in terms of drawing inferences about really my, macroscopic phenomena, like large scale phenomena, um, the incidence of certain diseases um, in a population the size of a city. 
from these really microscopic details, you know, um, mutation rates on individual genes. And that was very exciting to me, but it's still, it only accounts for about 15% of the total lifetime risk. If you look at the cumulative incidence, we can only explain about 15% of cases of colorectal cancer. Um, often colorectal adenocarcinoma is either malignant or pre-malignant on discovery. It makes it very difficult to constrain the timing um, of uh, specific drivers, like when did they arrive? Uh, what effect did they have? Uh, which of these drivers is say, necessary for malignancy of any of them? Or is it some kind of cooperative interaction between all of them together? Very difficult to say um, because uh, it, 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 statistically, it's, um, we have this issue of, um, uh, uh, of some kind of selection bias. Right? The, the, the set of cases that we look at um, is biased towards those that are symptomatic. Cases which are asymptomatic, which result in, say, a, a benign adenoma, these are less likely to be detected in the clinic. So there's fewer of them to compare from a scientific perspective. Um, despite the fact that this is one of the simplest possible models involving three different genes that we can come up with, it's still very complicated. We have, uh, uh, you know, five hits, 50 nodes, 270 paths, and very strong selection. It's a very complicated model. Um, and a lot of the analytical approximations we like to make become inaccurate when the probabilities become large, which in practice is on the order of the, on the order of the sojourn time, um, which for this class of models happens about 60 or 70 years. So there's still like there's a significant portion of the data set which becomes inaccurate when these analytical probabilities you know, um, uh, become large. Uh, there are ways around that. So we have um, we. Um, uh, we have direct numerical simulations. Uh, you can do some interesting things with the method of characteristics, find some exact solutions. Um, but, but still, it's a bit like, you know, this is a very common, uh, very common malignant, you, you know, a very, very common cancer, um, usually malignant or pre malignant when it's discovered. Um, these are the same things that make it difficult to study, right? They, they make it difficult to study scientifically. It's like looking at the sun. There's a large amount of statistical glare. Yeah. Uh, just the, the things that make it important are the same things that make it difficult to study. The probabilities are large. You know, it's usually symptomatic when it appears, so it's not a fair, like unbiased sample of the underlying, the underlying um, what the underlying disease caused might be, or this pre-cancerous uh, evolution, um, which led me to wonder, like, what other tumors, like I'll say tumors very carefully and not cancers, what other tumors are there um, for which these things aren't true? Um, so are, is there some type of, uh, some type of known tumor where the uh, genomic subtypes are much better characterized? Um, could we find one which is usually benign when it's discovered, which is difficult to do. It's quite difficult to do. You can find ones which are not, have not spread around, but they're not yet, you know, they're not truly benign when they're discovered more pre-malignant, um, uh, but ones which are genuinely benign when they're discovered, they're very low risk of spreading, grow very, very slowly. Uh, one with fewer hits, because having 270 different terms is difficult, makes these models difficult to work with. And one where it would also be nice if our analytical approximations were more accurate and these probabilities were low. Um, and all of these things require that you look at some rare tumor, which is initially benign, um, a rare tumor, which is initial rare tumors, which are initially benign, um, which also have well characterized genomics and genetics are very, very rare. And the main type of tumor that I found, or the first one that I found that I was really, really good, high quality studies on was vestibular schwannoma, um, in which we find that uh, a single tumor suppressor gene called NF2 or Merlin is altered in at least 85% of cases, possibly 100% of cases, depending on which of these two sources you believe more. Um, uh, but at least 85%, uh, it's usually benign when it's discovered, um, purely because of uh, where it's located anatomically, it tends to cause problems and become symptomatic, even when it's benign, uh, which makes it much easier to, well, from a scientific perspective, it means that there's a unique opportunity to study uh, malignant transformation. You know, when does it become malignant exactly? 
Why hasn't it become malignant? Can we compare it to other brain tumors to find out, you know, why it's, it's not malignant? Um, usually only requires three hits to describe most of the incidents. Um, how long do we have? Is it 45 minutes from now? Uh, we've got an hour. I'll okay. leave a bit of time. Yeah, I'll leave a bit of time for questions. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and um, it's relatively rare. Right, there's the lifetime risk of developing vestibular schwannoma specifically, which is a, a type of nerve sheath tumor on the uh, uh, vestibular, vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, well, this is it's about one in a thousand for all types of schwannoma, which is a general type of peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Um, it's, it's a bit higher, it's like one in 500, but it's still relatively rare. It's much rarer than, say, colorectal cancer or breast cancer, or many of these other. The, the most common ones individually. It's relatively rare. It's not the rarest, but it's relatively rare. So it's the same things that make it scientifically interesting are the same factors that, that make it rare. We have this rare benign tumor, and we have this high quality genomic data on it. Right? It's like, I think it's, it, it, it's like a 21st century version of these solar eclipses, in, in, which were very important in, in physics and chemistry. Right? It's a rare event, just because it's a rare event doesn't mean it's not scientifically valuable because it makes it easier to get this high quality data and single out, screen out lots of these other confounding factors, you know, uh, risk factors for it. You know, solar eclipses, they resulted in the discovery of, I think, helium, the, the gravitation of light. They're rare events, but they make more interesting science possible. So the motivation, this is, this is where most of it, most of this, this project began was, was this one 2005 paper on uh, uh, epidemiology suggests that uh, uh, we, we can try the same, uh, the same three event model or three hit model um, uh, without distinguishing between different mechanisms, very standard. Um, and it points out, you know, we can find that the, the fitting parameters for these fitnesses are very, very low much lower than the error bars on these fitnesses. And this three event model gives us a very, very good hit. It gives us a very, very good fit um, to data. And it suggests that, you know, a three hit model should have a fairly good fit to, to, to what we have, these three events. So that's the motivation for the model we developed here. So the start point for this model is this node here, all the normal cells start here, um, moving out and each of these colored end nodes is some different type of vestibular schwannoma that carries a different pattern of mutations, a different set of like uh, gen genomic features. Um, so, so this magenta node here has two point mutations or small mutations on MF2, and it has one uh, gain of function mutation that hasn't currently been characterized. Um, this yellow one down here is. Um, um, mutation on smart b one one point mutation on smart b 2 and loss of heterozygosity, so a copy number loss on 22Q, where both of these are located, and the uh, last node up here, which accounts for most of the probability of this model, has uh, loss of heterozygosity, so it's copy number loss on 22Q, point mutation on the other copy of NF2, and some other gain of function mutation you know, what I call gain of function X. Yeah. We don't know. We add one hypothetical oncogene, um, which is this GFX here. Um, and, you know, we find we have this, this model which performs, it performs well, performs well. So each of these subtypes just looks like a simple power law. So this blue node up here is proportional to age cubed. Um, each of these are proportional to age cubed um, and in full. Well, we can figure out what the other terms in this should look like just by tracing out each of these parts. You know, we should have a product of this term, this term, this term. And there are six different ways we can make this. So we multiply all this by six. And there's, of course, the number of initial like uh, precursor cells that we start with as well. Okay. Um, so incidence is just one. Thing we're interested in predicting. Uh, we're also interested in predicting the relative frequency of different genomical durations. Um, so this is where it gets really exciting, is we can point out that both this blue node and this yellow node um, have uh, uh, copy number loss on 22Q. 
Right? So the proportion of all of these found tumors, which should have copy number loss on 22Q, should be, well, we add these two together, right? And then we just divide by the total probability that we find any of them. So this particular, this line here, I hope this notation isn't too cute. <laughs> It took me absolutely ages to get the colored like squares in the equations that we're here. So um, we can also look at the frequency of uh, SMART P1 alterations as well. We should notice that the, the magenta and the blue ones shouldn't have any alterations in SMART P1. Only this one down here should have alterations in SMART P1, so it should be rare. Um, no higher than 10%, I think, by comparing the schwannoma and other tissues. Um, uh, in fact, we didn't find any. Um, but you know, I think it's like naught to ten percent. It should be rare anyway. Um, and we can use these two estimates for the frequency of loss of heterozygosity on 22Q and for alterations to SMART P1. We can use we can combine these with our epidemiological data. Um, I also used epidemiological data for this study in 2005 um, to fix some parameters. And we can draw some uh, really interesting, like new parameter estimates from this fitting process. So uh, we get a model of the cumulative incidence, which is this black dotted line up here. This gives us uh, a model, just the sum of these, uh, of all of these nodes added together. How quickly do we end up with, with, with tumors on any of these? Um, uh, there's some proportion that have loss of heterozygosity on 22Q, and there's some proportion of alterations to, to spark P1. I think this is very rare. Um, we can work backwards and we can fit, um, we can get estimates of um, this point mutation rate. So in, in, instead of in the colorectal cancer project, we did it entirely ab initio with, with, with no fitting. Um, for this project, we can treat each of these parameters like it was a fitting parameter. And by finding unique um, solutions for each of these, we can find these new uh, parameter estimates. So. As uh, the rate of loss of heterozygosity on uh, uh, 22 on 20 Q, um, and we can write this as a probability as well. So we can just the same graph with a different you know, multiplier on the scale. Um, the point mutation rate. So this combines both substitutions and indels. Um, uh, uh, U uh, we find is around 0 0.5, 0 0.4 times 10 to the minus nine per base pair per, per division. And we can also find the number of sensitive sites. So it's like a proxy for the size of this hypothetical gain of function uh, mutation. This is, this is very large. I think this is very large. Like typically most of the uh, tumor suppressors that I've looked at will have some value for the number of sensitive sites of around 100. Um, KRAS was very low. Since this is supposed to be gain of function, I'd guess that this should be like around 10 to 20. So. I think that is probably around, this might represent more than one G. I represent, I don't know, 10 to 20 different gain of function genes. Completely, you know, I'm, I'm speculating with, with that. I'm speculating with 10 to 20 different genes. I think. Um, also interested in one of the reasons I found vestibular schwannoma interesting was it's almost always benign. Like we will only see malignant transformation in one one in 1,000 cases of, of, of vestibular schwannoma. Vestibular schwannoma is already uncommon. Um, it's already uncommon. Um, it's already uncommon. So this is really, this is an ultra rare outcome. It's not so rare that it never occurs. Um, I have a couple of images here uh, from a case study in, in 2010 um, that I've been reading a lot. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a great paper, actually. It includes links to most of the other known cases in the literature. Um, it had, so this is a very rare outcome. It's only one, uh, one in a thousand cases, um, but the five-year survival rate is really bleak. It's like 10 to 20 percent, right, depending on how you count. Again, this is a very small sample size, but, you know, it's a very bleak outcome. So it's very rare, but it's a very important, very important outcome. Um, it's really, really difficult to try and estimate how common this is exactly. Um, I, it, so I wanted to see, um, or to try and quantify why this happens, I wanted to try and see if we could take this successful like, ab initio approach, um, working our way up from uh, 
working our way up from the molecular level to the population level um, to see what we could constrain uh, about the mechanism by which this happens. You know, could this happen? We have some growing tumor, um, and it's initially a benign tumor. Um, possibly some mutant cell line arises in this benign tumor um, that has the potential to become malignant and invasive. Um, uh, how could this mutant cell line arise? Is it by the activation, is it by gain of function or is it by a loss of function? Is there an oncogene that gets activated or is it a tumor suppressor gene that gets inactivated? Very, very difficult to tell. So in preliminary work for, uh, uh, for our current paper, I looked at these two different possibilities. Um, and you'll remember, you'll remember in case the connection isn't totally clear, um, you'll remember that I did estimate the probability of loss of heterozygosity in this type of tumor and the point mutation rate. So in theory, we should be able to guess some different numbers for the sensitivity, the, the sensitivity of this gain of function gene and for the sensitivity of this, of this loss of function, this tumor suppressor gene that we haven't identified and try and see which numbers fit the data best, which of them you know, result in some plausible you know, values for the lifetime risk. Um, for the oncogene activation, we find that regardless of the size of mg you choose, you can choose it to be as small as, as one. If you have a, some gain of function gene which requires only a single like alteration on a single base pair somewhere, which is you know outrageously sensitive, you still find that the probability that a given vestibular schwannoma would become malignant would just approach one basically immediately. Like whenever they became to some detectable size, which is usually 10 to, 10 to 30 millimeters in diameter, um, they would essentially always have become malignant. So we can say this is, this is not the likely outcome. Like the, the upper limit, the lifetime upper limit on the risk of malignant transformation should be about one in a thousand, right? If for any given plausible parameter value, they're given one, right? We find that we're exceeding this, you know, something, something must be wrong. This, this, this bottle can't be accurate. So there are good reasons to think that it's not caused by gain of function activate, um, mutation. It's not caused by an additional gain of function activation. Um, other, because if it was, it wouldn't be a rare outcome. We know it's a rare outcome, a priori, even if that's the only thing we know, and our parameter estimates from before, um, we can still say that it's probably not um, a gain of function mutation. Um, and when we look at a, uh, this second model where we have some unknown tumor suppressor, tumor suppressor X, um, can this, can inactivation of this explain uh, observed levels of uh, uh, observed lifetime risk of malignant transformation? We find something that is much more, um, much more, uh, much more in line uh, with uh, with observed risk of this happening. This uh, the different values of MTSX, and by fitting MTSX to um, to agree with uh, the uh, risk that we see, uh, we can find uh, we can we can fit we can treat this as a fitting parameter as well find some best estimate for MTSX, and we can try and figure out, uh, we can try and place some constraints on the size um, and, well, I was hoping location, I made some progress with location, but not very much. We can place some constraints on the size of MTSX. The idea here is to compare it to similar sensitivity parameters, the number of sensitive sites on other genes, on known sequences, and compare. And from this, we find out our best estimate we have this very large error bars on this, as you might expect, but our best estimate is around about 1,200, which is huge when we compare it to uh, the number of known sites on known tumor suppressors like P53. Because my first hypothesis, natural hypothesis, was, ah, um, well, this is the last two steps after a three rate limiting events, perhaps like colorectal cancer, this last gene that pushes it over the edge to becoming malignant is, is P53, which has lots of interactions, um, uh, controls very complicated you know, uh, you know, processes like uh, DNA repair, cell differentiation, you know, loss of function of P53 is very complicated effects. Maybe this could explain um, malignant transformation. 
Um, and the answer is no, because the number of sensitive sites on P53 is a bit less than a tenth of what we estimate for the number of sensitive sites on this hypothetical tumor surprise. Doesn't mean that it's not P53. It does mean that it's not only P53. Right? It might be P53 and many other tumor suppressors that interact with it in the same in the same signaling pathway. Again, that's speculating, right? But the most that I can say is that we can't explain the observed level of risk with simply one gene. Right? We can rule out that it's you know monocausal for at least this one gene. I think it is unlikely to be explained um, in terms of any single gene. Um, just because a um, cursory look at various different known genes in the human body, just taking the largest known genes and trying to calculate the number of sensitive sites on each of them, you know, if I, there are very, very few genes where you can get numbers this big. So I think this is almost certainly multiple loss of function genes. Um, and the last thing I was going to talk about was um, the extension of this to radiation damage, um, in which uh, we want to know uh, how much more likely is malignant transformation, given that we now know, uh, now, now have a parameter estimate for NTSX, we can treat the sun sensitivity parameter, um, uh, how likely is malignant transformation following uh, a dose of radiation at a given size? Uh, again, working our way up from like, bioinformatics and very low level like, biophysical considerations. Um, we have these three dose-dependent effects. We want to know how likely is it that we induce a double-strand break at some, at some given locus? Um, how likely is it this is then misrepaired? And then how likely is it that a cell survives after we've induced a double-strand break and it's been misrepaired on some known gene, some given gene, it's TSX. Um, and what matters is you know, the number of sensitive sites on TSX as well. So, we have some photon comes in, does something to some precursor cells. We treat it as a tumor initiating event. It'd be interesting to look at other models where it was a tumor promoting event instead. That you know, again, uh, is research that I haven't done yet. Um, so for double strand break induction, uh, you know the probability. There, there are very detailed measurements of this. I was very impressed by by this paper from 2018. Um, they have some experiments with magnetic nanoparticles. And, you know, actual clinical energies. They had a six megavolt linear accelerator and they zapped bits of DNA with it. It's very, very nice. Um, we can simply use a, a, a linear interpolation between doses of naught and 100 gray. This is all six megavolt. Um, and, you know, it gives us something which is perfectly fine. There is some tailing off behavior, but it's not relevant to our model. Um, the probability of misrepair, we know empirically that this should be dose dependent. We know that it's dose dependent. We know it should also be dose rate dependent as well. Um, but uh, because for the purposes of modeling radio surgery and uh, fractionated radiotherapy, the, both the dose and the dose rate are very high. We can use these repair error rates of around 50%, which is very high. Like normally at very, very low doses, this, the error rate in uh, doubles tramp break is repair should be much lower. And this is essentially because there are multiple mechanisms of double strand break misrepair. You have um, homologous recombination. So at very, very low dose rates, you should have these very low error repair mechanisms. And at very high dose rates, you should have these higher error repair mechanisms as well. But the, the idea in all this is just getting an upper bound. If we use upper bounds for all our estimates, we should get an upper bound on the final probability. Um, and of course, this. Uh, the number of sites where we could have an indel, you know, from the double strand break misrepair. Um, you know, this is, we can estimate this in terms of, you know, NTSX, which we've already just estimated by looking at right risk. Uh, and, you know, we will find that for essentially any, uh, any clinically relevant dose in unfractionated radio surgery, which will be like at least 10, like 20 gray or something, the excess risk of malignant transformation is essentially zero. Um, this, this, this has some, some, some caveats, like this uh, does not, this considers only sporadic cases where we have an isolated, um, an isolated tumor that we can deliver a homogenous dose to. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's some missing mechanisms. Um, 
it's bothering me that the dose rate dependence of the uh, of the double strand break misrepair um, is, is is missing. We use only an upper bound. A much more detailed model um, would be nice. So I'm aware of a couple in the literature, um, but I'm not happy that experiments can distinguish them at the moment. Um, I have some ideas for how this could be done, but it would be expensive, and it's, it's a few years away, I think. Um, more achievable is probably multifocal tumors, familial NF2, um, you know, and uh, a, a more detailed like correlation with like actual 3D models, the way that medical physicists actually target these things would be would really, really nice. Um, so tying all this together, we have better estimates of event rates in Schwann cells, especially mutation rates. Um, we can constrain the timing of whatever the, the mysterious loss of function mutations that trigger malignancy um, but can't rule out that there are non-genetic mechanisms that trigger malignancy it could be that there's some gain of function and some complicated like immune surveillance type stuff going on but of the two models we considered loss of function is much more likely um, we can interestingly we can put some constraints on the size of the gain of function that results in a benign tumor and the loss of function that results from the malignant tumor. Um, and we can say that at least for sporadic vestibular schwannoma, where the individual tumors are well isolated, um, it, you know, radiotherapy is, is probably fine. You know, there, are some, there are some huge uncertainties in that, but uh, the actual excess risk of malignancy seems to be tiny. Yeah. Yeah. So lots to do, lots to do. Um, this is pretty much the end of the talk, so I guess we'll move on to questions from people. Um, now we have the fun of people unmuting themselves and uh, having no speakers. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for that. So I'll give you a round of applause. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so what we'll do is, I guess, since I can't seem to get any sound out, uh, if you have any questions, then please do pop them in the chat. I might try switching speaker to see if that does it. Uh, okay. But do we have any questions in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had one question. Well, people might. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, we, you, you showed a, uh, a plot near the end of, of uh, uh, it was like incidence versus tumor size. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So is the is the is the tumor size in the incident state you use, or is that an inferred relationship from the sort of tumor size means there's this probability of this happening? So uh, which one was it? Was it the, bit for, uh, little bit further, a little bit further, a bit further. It was the second to the last part of the talk. So before the radiation stuff. A bit later so, now, actually. So it was later than this. Yeah. Oh, um, after like, this one. Yeah. So this tumor diamond, that this one. This one. This yeah. one. So this is uh, this is not instance. This is the probability that uh, there's a mutation yes. in here that will trigger malignant transformation. Which I suppose is kind of like instance, right? <laughs> it's kind of like instance, more like risk. Yeah. Like normally when people say instance, that what we have in mind is some number of people who turn up in a given year with a given yes. you know, disease. So so what I meant, what I was going to ask about that is if you have that, uh, so you've inferred that, right? that you don't have the data on the, the size of the tumors from these people. The, the, the data, no, the, so well, the data okay. is they have there's, it or they don't. There's some constraints on like tumor size, which yeah. are reasonable from like reading various case reports and seeing how big the biggest ones are. They almost always seem to be less than, 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 than 50. Right? I mean, if so, they're too big, they won't actually fit in, you know, the yeah, canal. Yeah. No, so, I know, I'm saying, well, I, I guess the question is, is that a reasonable way to test the results of this model? Is it if there was some data on tumor size? Yeah. If there was data on tumor size, you would expect to see the malignant ones yeah. being up this end and very, very... Right, very, right, I see. Any I see, yeah. Yeah, yes. If there was, like, data on tumor size, then we could... Yeah, that would be an interesting way to, to, to go and test it. I would have to dig out this uh, case report by Andreas Dimitriades again. And yeah, I mean, you might have like a handful to work with, which probably is yeah. enough, right? But yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I think uh, probably 12, at okay. least 12 as of 2010, if <laughs> you go through and look through. But yeah, no, that's, that, that's an interesting I just think idea. of other ways of testing these mechanisms that isn't just 
you know, yeah, what, what I mean, you have at the moment. That would be that would be the most direct, I suppose. Uh, it still yeah, wouldn't tell you it's right, but it would tell you it it's wouldn't tell you it's right. It would, it would give you an extra data point to fit to. Uh, yeah. Fit to, yeah. Uh, what software do you use to visualize your models as networks? Um, uh, it depends on the diagram you're talking about. Um, but for most of the diagrams that look like this on the left, I just made them by hand in Inkscape. Um, and for <laughs> the big complicated one, so this one was also made by hand in Inkscape. Um, and for the big complicated one in colorectal cancer, this was um, visualized systematically using some output from the uh, simulation project on GitHub. And I filtered this through a set script and then put that result through graphers. So this is in the, the graphers package. And that's 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 all the software I use really. It's just Inkscape and graphers. So it's all open source. You're you're very welcome. Okay. Uh, well, if there's no more questions, then uh, I think thank you all for uh, for coming along virtually and uh, for coming on in person. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So yeah, hopefully we'll get a few more of these going in person after Easter as well, and we can encourage more people to, to come out, come along. But uh, yes, this will go online as recorded. So if you've got any, if you know anyone who couldn't make it, wants to catch up, then uh, I'll send an email around with the recording and you'll be able to send them that. So, so thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks. Bye.